What's up, Minions? This is David Stark from WatcherPass.com, your website for movie reviews, interviews, and recommendations. Today, I'm, tr- I'm joined by Antoine Lee, the director and producer, and Matthew Solomon, who plays Mike, a.k.a. Drop the Mic, in the all-new found footage vlogger horror film, Followed. We're going to talk to Antoine and Matthew in just a second, but first, let's check out that trailer. So why did you write about Hotel Lemmix? I began to understand why it was so frightening. After I learned more about its sordid history. Are you seriously going to ditch the vlog over one hotel? This is different. I also watch horror movies. That doesn't mean that I believe in everything that I see in them. What's up, minions? Drop the mic here. Many people don't know this, but real-life serial killer. In 1913, right here is the dumpster where David almost would dump his dismembered body. Shut up, Michael! I just had an incredible phone call. They just told me that if I can get 50,000 subscribers by the end of Halloween weekend. Okay, that's the hedge. Okay, it's in a hotel that the unenlightened claim is mildly haunted. Well, you know, absolutely thrilled. We got a couple of- Chris? Chris? Whatever you do, keep the lens up, okay? That's what you don't get, Mike. It's not about them being real. It's about you provoking them. I feel like you're in danger and I need you to come home, okay? I think I made a mistake, and and I and I have to finish. Why? So thank you so much for joining me today. We have Matthew Solomon, who plays Mike, aka Drop the Mic, and Antoine Lee, who's the director and producer of the all-new found footage vlogger horror film Followed. So thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I'll get right into the questions. Um, so Antoine, you didn't write this and that's that's not a critique or anything i'm just curious you know what drew you to this script how did you find this uh this film and you know how did you develop it into what it was um yeah so uh long story short i saw the news this was back in 2013 i saw the news about um the hotel cecil and elisa lamb and literally that story just really haunted me in the sense that yeah, there's just so much uh going on there and there's like you know there's this mystique and uh, you know, and, and it's very similar to you know, the film, the you know, the Japanese world from Dark Water. I'm not sure that you've seen that movie. Mm-hmm. So I, so I, at first, I didn't think it was real that it was you know one of those viral marketing campaign. However, it was real that basically just drew my interest into it. And I started talking to my producer uh, Matt Prubaker about it. That hey, I really want to, you know, I'm really interested in this subject. Maybe we could produce it. I didn't, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to direct it, just going to produce it. And then Matt told me that Todd Click, the writer, you know, his friend, the writer, he's also been very interested in this hotel as well. So, you know, he got us both together and then over beers and over the course of the next uh, few months, we just, you know, we, we meet up once a week, just going over beers and going over uh, concepts. And uh, next thing you know, you know, Cut, uh, I started to write the script. And obviously, during the, in the meantime, we also started casting prior to having the script done as well. Because, you know, Todd, but the writer wanted to feel what the Drop the Mic character would be like. And thank God, you know, we auditioned Matt and, you know, he came in and killed it. And basically, the whole character of Drop the Mic was, uh, was inspired by Matt, uh, Matt's book. That's so awesome because oftentimes I'll talk to, you know, writers and directors who kind of write everything and then kind of have character, you know, actors come in to play those characters. And sometimes, you know, maybe they look differently than, you know, what you envision. But th- that's so awesome that you were able to kind of build out that character, Matt, and, and kind of make it your own and, and feed that into the script. So how did, how did the script come to you? How did you get involved in this? Did you also know about the Cecil Hotel and the and the Kim elevator incident? Yeah, so um, I was living uh, right below downtown LA at USC at the time. Oh, and I went so- to USC too, fight on. I know. <laughs> yeah, we are, we're all over the place, aren't we? Uh, and so, you know, I'd heard about the Elisa Lamb story on the news and uh, was super fascinated by it because I'm one of those people who doesn't like watching scary movies, but I love reading about them, which is kind of cheating. Um, uh, and so I didn't have an agent at the time and they were casting, fortunately, people who were represented and not represented. Um, so I saw that the horror movie was about that story and I was like oh great I totally want to audition for that and it was actually really appealing to me that there was no script because I love improvising and I knew that and I know that's one of my strengths so getting to do an entire audition completely improvised was really great um yeah and then I got to join the project and it was super exciting and you know Antoine said that they uh 
talked about the project over beers and that's pretty much what we did for the next, I think, year until we actually shot the film. They would just call me up and say, hey, we need to meet up and talk to you, get an idea for the character. It was really cool getting to be a part of creating the character that I was playing. Um, I don't know if I'll ever really get to do that again in my life, knock on wood. That is, that is kind of crazy that you just improvised that whole character because you felt very fleshed out. I mean, did you, you know, I guess, did you watch YouTube vlogs? I know that was kind of a different time in 2013. So maybe this just wasn't as uh, as normal as it is now. But, you know, your, your character did feel like a legitimate vlogger. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that I just like, you know, I was a teenager and a college student when YouTube personalities really blew up. So there was no avoiding them. I just, I knew who they all, I didn't know who they all were, but like they were just sort of a part of online culture and, and, and media at the time. So you couldn't get away from it. Um, I found most of them really annoying. <laughs> so I think that's why, I think that's why Mike is ultimately kind of an annoying person as well. Uh, it was very true to form. So it was, I think that Antoine and Todd and Matt wanted Mike to be kind of a satirical take on a YouTube blogger, like they're, we're kind of pointing the finger at these, at these personalities. Um, so I definitely had that same attitude <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, well, we actually did have a basis for the character and, you know, the arc or whatnot, but we'll ultimately, so we actually did have bases for basically every single character and we have a basic storyline, you know, from point A to point B, we needed, you know, the personality. To, to, to come into play and that's what uh, you know that's where Matt came to be um, now as far as research is concerned as you know just like Matt like well, I I was never into the whole blogging culture like I'm you know, just like you might actually find the majority of a super annoying right the one thing that I actually realized when I actually started watching the videos is that you know they are annoying they are um, you know even repugnant but I couldn't stop watching them right it's just there's just something weird about them like wow, you know, like how much more of a jerk can this guy be? But I can't stop watching, right? So it was, uh, so there was one of the things that, that you know, that we wanted to, 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 to put in the script uh, and, you know, to, to film it is that we want Matt to be a fully fleshed, fleshed out, you know, vlogger, just like the ones that you have to see, you know, out there. So, so that's, uh, so that, that's kind of like how we came up with Drop the Mic. There is definitely, and, and I don't know, I, I not, don't really follow vlogging today, so maybe it's it's changed and evolved just as everything, but there, there definitely seems to have been like a, you know, escalation aspect to it where you kind of have to keep one-upping and, and keep kind of shocking, almost like an old school shock jock uh, in, in past times. So, you know, and, and I think that definitely did flow through into Drop the Mic's character. He was, you know, as, as you see, and anyone can watch the film, he he definitely tries to go for that uh, that magna, yeah, one thing that I noticed, <laughs> magnetism, yeah, one thing yeah. that I noticed is that every moment is the most exciting moment for these bloggers. That's what the, like, every time the camera starts, it's the most exciting time the camera has started, you know? So I think yeah. you get a lot of that from Mike. <laughs> Which is, you know, that, that, that kind of explains why Antoine couldn't stop watching it, right? Because you just, you yeah. get attached to it. You just want to see that excitement. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, 100%. right, right. And like, you know, the editing, the, the professional editing that happens is actually pretty cool. And like the music they use as well. Now, keep in mind, though, I, I you know, for research, maybe I watch like three vlogs, total of maybe like 30 minutes. Um, you know, so it's not much of research, so to speak, because, uh, again, I didn't want to create, you know, a character that's based on a real life vlog. I want this to be his own creation. But we do take elements from different bloggers out there. So I didn't want to be, you know, too influenced by it um so you know uh, uh, um so so that's what we did but yeah like watching those vloggers is just is funny is repugnant and just repulsive but i just couldn't stop watching it was really fun <laughs> and, it's, it's just my dog. and it uh it also seems like you know there there were elements taken from the hotel and the history and whatnot you know that, that were changed uh was that also kind of part of this choice i assume maybe part of it was also just rights issues i don't know i you know i noticed that there was a lot about the hotel that that you kind of draw the connection to but everything was kind of slightly tweaked for the movie was there was there a reason for that uh antoine <laughs> uh yes there was so so basically you know a lot of the the story you know what i always tell my viewers is that if you really wanted to to get the whole full experience of the film you're gonna see it, you know twice first time it's just to get the story second time is to pick up the details 
Uh, and preferably is that if you actually study more of the actual hotel itself, then the movie is actually even more meaningful if you actually know. You know, one of the, the things that we actually get, uh, or, or, or one, one of the more popular feedback we got is that, hey, there are too many ghosts. We don't know what they're coming from. Like, you know, like a little bit of back history, right? And uh, we, we did it on purpose because of the fact that, you know, the hotel itself is such a mystery. Everything that actually happened there, there's literally no connection. It just happens, right? So I wanted to, to have that realistic feeling of you going into it, you see these things, you just don't understand it. There's a larger universe that you don't yet understand. So, uh, so, so that, that, that was point A. And then point B, why we are, you know, why we change the names or, uh, or tweak the scenarios, because we honestly, we just wanted to be respectful to the depth. You know, for lack of better words, right? Because we, it's funny because like we, we talk, you know, we criticize the, the vlogging culture and the social influencer uh, uh, culture that they exploit tragedies for likes, but on the same token, we kind of like doing the same sort of thing, right? <laughs> so these are all real. So we get it. That is one of the things that we wanted to to basically put in the film. That's a, it's it's kind of like, hey, it is a critique on this whole tragedy thing and part of what we do is we want to make sure that we don't use real names we don't really use real events but we tweak them to put them into our universe but give give them a lot, uh, enough you know familiarity so that people who know about the hotel would actually enjoy the movie even more and that's that's what, exactly what i did i saw the movie and you know some of the stories did sound familiar uh, you know some of the serial killer stories sounded a little familiar but off and then the elevator story as well so then i went and read about them so that's kind of exactly what uh you know what your purpose was awesome awesome <laughs> um so you know it's kind of going on that same note uh matt and drop the mic had a lot of you know true crime horror references and things like that you said that you you know you don't watch much horror but you like to read about it was that just organic, uh, you know, improvisation. Did you go in and research some of these uh, references? Um, basically, if there was a bit of dialogue or a script that was handed to me with a reference, I would go and I would just research it a, a, enough to be ready to walk on set and talk about it. And maybe, you know, they once we had the script, they also gave me a lot of uh, free reign to sort of throw new stuff in there as I felt as I saw fit. So I would try to walk on set with as much, just, just a few extra bits of knowledge in case I wanted to throw in a cool random fact here and there. Um, for the most part though, you know, what's nice about playing a character who's teaching an audience about um, all of these different uh, stories is that you yourself learn about the story before you get on set to, to perform it. So there wasn't <laughs> as much research needed because, uh, you know, it was, I was learning a lot. I was learning a lot about the sort of dark histories of Los Angeles and who knew LA had so many serial killers and so much murder. It's, it's right, right. Surprise. I think that, um, before we shot the movie, we had also shot a few sort of independent drop the, mic vlog, drop the mic vlogs that are in the film. But I think that there's even one or two that we shot that aren't in the film. So right. where we were just exploring the city and talking about different, uh, different serial killers. So yeah, I know uh, more about serial killers than I think I would normally watch. <laughs> uh, well, the credit had to go to uh, the Todd Click, or, you know, the writer for all the research. Todd is the type of writer that, you know, he literally spends weeks and months trying to dig up all possible histories of, you know, uh, uh, of whatever subject that he's actually writing. So, you know, so it's in the script, like, you know, all of the details and all of that. Matt dropped the mic, you know, he just added his own flavor. So, you know, there was one scene that I, I really love to see this. It's a very little minor detail, right? But uh, it's in the back alley where they're just showing the, you know, the dumpster where, quote unquote, the character David Olmos was supposed to actually drop all the body parts. And in the script, that's what it says. But Matt is like, hey, Chris, watch out for the street juice. And I could not stop laughing. I was like, yeah, that <laughs> totally dropped the mic, right? And that, so those little details, they actually add so much, you know, to the character. Of that's where Matt comes in. That was just perfect. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely appreciated the, uh, you know, some of the, the humor and the, the random aside that dropped the mic had. It was, it felt like a lot of fun, and you know, I, uh, it was, I, it was really fun to do. It was yeah. so fun, just kind of getting to let go of the reins and say whatever popped into my head. <laughs> it's, really cool. it's like, uh, it's like true acting, right? You just get to kind of be a different character. Yeah, exactly. You really get to uh, be as impulsive as you want. <laughs> 
Um, one of the things that I liked, and I'm not sure if this is from the script or, or something that you brought, there was a, a part when you're talking about the challenge and he dressed up as, as Michael Myers, but like this strange, like grandma looking Michael Myers. And I just couldn't <laughs> Sorry, stop laughing. I, I loved it. <laughs> Do you have the wig? Uh, I wish I had the wig. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I remember they were like, you're going to jump as, first of all, don't hate me for this. I didn't know who Mike Myers was when we shot this. And I had to oh, look wow. it up because I haven't seen any of the movies. I know it's really terrible. Um, the but the, they were the like, new one's very good. Uh, the, one, the, the brand new remake with Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody was talking about that. Um, mm. uh, so <laughs> they were like, oh, you're going to wear this jumpsuit. I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool jumpsuit. They were like, oh, we're going to paint your face white. And I was like, oh, that's kind of ghoulish. They were like, oh, we're going to put this wig on you. I was like, oh, I'm a troll doll. <laughs> 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 but it was it's very drop the mic like of course he's gonna have this sort of look for this yeah. character, you know um so yeah i wish i had that wig i didn't really get many keepsakes from set unfortunately i think i walked away with one of drop the mic's shirts i think that's pretty much it oh he also <laughs> those glasses that mike is wearing through most of the movie were my glasses as well so that's go. my keepsake <laughs> and all the depraved memories from that research that you did. So and you all of the, the scars and, <laughs> and nightmares. It's all beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, Antoine, you mentioned, or, and, and you did too, as well, Matthew, uh, that there might be some footage that was not included. Was that released somehow? Is there a, I mean, it seems like a perfect viral marketing campaign if you were going to just release a couple of uh, those vlogs <laughs> and let people find them. Yeah, we we actually do have a plan on releasing them because well the script was 144 pages right so we actually <laughs> shot the entire 144 pages the original cut of the film was literally two hours and a half right so we have to cut an hour down so not only are there you know additional vlogs that we did not put in the movie that we already cut and everything else but we didn't put in the movie but also there are additional you know character building sequences right like where you know you would actually see a deeper relationship between matt and uh and his you know and his fiance uh jess and you would actually see a lot more you know uh banter between the cast you know uh, the, the, sorry the the crew so it's more like a way for for, for audience to look at you know matt or oh, drop the mic with all of his bravado down you know this is where like he's not really drop the mic he's actually you know he's actually mike from from from, from the movie um so we decided to cut them simply because of pacing right because we actually had it and all of a sudden it just it didn't feel like a horror film anymore but it's, it felt very much like a coming of age film which is you know which is which is cool but it just, it wasn't the horror vibe that we went for. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, we definitely are going to think of a ways to either reincorporate into like maybe a director's cut or maybe into like, you know, DVD extras or, you know, some marketing materials. So we still are working on it. We're not sure what to do with them yet. But yes, those, those scenes will see the light of day sooner. <laughs> I really want to see them because I haven't seen a lot of them and I'm very curious as to what they turned out like as well. <laughs> yeah they, they're really wonderful yeah. <laughs> they are they are uh so uh you, you mentioned some of the other members of uh drop the mics crew and um you know i was curious did they also get cast early on and were able to kind of build out their characters or were they or were they all brought on after the the 144 page script was written <laughs> um the majority of them were actually cast um you know, before the script is fully written, it was, we, we were already writing it, or sorry, Todd was already writing it. Uh, Matt was, was the first one, and as we developed more characters, we actually did some more casting, so we did uh, recruit the majority, uh, you know, of the actors. But at that time, you know, by the time that we actually cast the last person, I think the script was already maybe 80 or 90% done. Uh, because, you know, the most important thing is that we wanted to nail the drop the mic personality you know, down. So once that's down, like the, the, like the rest of the characters, they were already fully fleshed out. So we, you know, we had already cast it. And I think one of our cast actually did have to drop because she had another project or whatnot. So we had to, to we ultimately had to recast that role. Uh, but everything worked out great. And uh, we also wrote uh, an additional role. You know, this is for the character of, of, of Caitlin, you know, Nick. The, 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 the editor. It's mm -hmm. because when Nate came in the edition and, you know, like she, she was auditioning for, for a different part, but we really, I, I particularly loved her performances. And so I bet that's why we, I asked Todd, it's like, hey, Todd, can you, 
change the gender of one of the uh, you know of one of the characters, the editor. You know, his name was supposed to be Nick. So now we 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 shortened it down to Nick, and we basically put Caitlin in there. So those are some of the changes. Um, so yes, it is not like hey, we have 144 pages ready now. Let's cast it. But we actually do it concurrently. Awesome. And uh, were any of the were any of the other cast members Trojans? Just just out of curiosity. <laughs> no, I'm the only Trojan. I think I was the only Trojan involved in the project entirely. Can't think of yeah. anybody else. Yeah. Well, From the get-go, yeah. correct. That makes sense. The star would be a Trojan. <laughs> 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 we got that fight on pride going for you. There you go. Um, so. Yeah, well, another thing that was really interesting is some of the equipment that was used to kind of make the vlog come alive. You know, there was a, there were camera hats and then there was a drone, you know, what percent, like, was any of that actually used to film or was it all just, you know, props that were then used, you know, you used more traditional camera work to get the shots. It feels like the drone was probably used, but I, I don't know. I'm not sure how you did some of those shots. Yeah, uh, yes. So the drone was used for the overhead, you know, for the city shot, obviously down the basement. No, we actually used a traditional camera. And basically, yeah, so the only the drone would use all of the other shots, you know, like the camera, the hat cams and all that, those are just props. Like we, we planned on do on doing on using the actual equipment because we actually did buy it. We actually did buy a hat cam and everything else. But it, I just didn't I didn't want to use them just because, you know, I although this is a found footage film, I wanted to make it look not like a found footage film, if that makes sense. Right? I wanted to make it look more professionally edited, just like how a vlogger would. And on the same token is that, you know, I, um, I like my films to be more, you know, quote unquote cinematic. So therefore I want to be able to control my shots, control the colors and the angles and everything else. And that's why you no, know, the all of the shots actually shot by our uh, director of photography, Nelson. He's the one that did everything. We and he used his own equipment, which is the camera, uh, um, which is the one main camera that used everything else, which is props. I've got, to, I've got to give a major shout out to our camera to Nelson, our DP, because he um he was basically one of the actors because, you know, at every point in the movie, somebody, one of the characters is holding a camera. And when we did that, it was literally like an actor standing behind Nelson as he shot everything, basically with their arms wrapped around him, whispering in his ear. Like it was, <laughs> he got very, very intimate with us. And he was a really, he was a really good actor in a sense, because he was willing to improvise with us at certain points. And he caught certain things that we were throwing that that a, a stationary camera wouldn't have necessarily been able to pick up that um, last minute. So it was he he really did he, he made the movie. He really really did such a good job. He did. He 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 was really fantastic. It was a blessing to have him. And I'm definitely gonna be working with him again. Like the guy's really he he understood you know pretty much the angles and everything else. So he was amazing. He was a godsend. Yeah, such an interesting point when you've got people who are supposed to be wearing cameras, but you're not using that. Yeah, that's uh, it's kind of like in a video game where you you know you, you see the actual character and they're just like grotesque form to like make it work. And it sounds like that's kind of similar to what your characters were in in this film. Right, right. <laughs> and it, it's kind of a benefit that it came out now. I, I, it sounds like the film. Would you film it in like around 2016 or was it filmed 2018? Uh, September 2016. Okay. It's kind of a benefit that it came out now because you know personal tele, you know technology for cameras has progressed so far that you couldn't you know I didn't even really think that other than the fact that the camera looked really good I didn't think like oh this is a professional camera versus this is someone's you know personal portable camera because iPhones True. can capture basically the same thing so it's kind of a correct nice correct like, yeah the, the the quality you know from one of those hat cams are actually extremely good I was really surprised when I actually saw the real quality and it was four years. ago. I just imagine what it looks like. So the uh, the whole genesis of this conversation was uh, myself, and Antoine, and, and someone uh, from, I think, Fred's Horror Corner, who I actually don't know, but it was a fun conversation on Twitter talking about the film. Uh, and, and budget was definitely something that came up. So, you know, Antoine, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, budget issues that you ran into and some of the things you might have learned from that, that would be, you know, fantastic to hear as well. Um, sure. Yeah. So, so in the beginning, you know, we, cause we were a brand new production company that we wanted to make, you know, something that is uh, meaningful, good, you know, make money for investors and basically to show that, Hey, us as a production company, we know how to make a movie. Right. So 
uh, we raised a certain amount of money. A lot of them are basically friends and family and my own personal savings. Um, <clears throat> so as the project got developed and as we started filming, we realized that again, filming in LA is crazy expensive. I'm talking about, you know, our initial budget, two thirds of our initial budget went on to pay for permits, insurance, the LAPD. Oh, wow. I kid you not, two thirds of the budget, right? The, the, and then the last one, the last third is what we used for the actual production. So wow. during production, we actually ran out of money several times. And Matt remember this, uh, and Matt uh, uh, also remembers this as well, which is one of the days that we were filming, I, inv I invited one of my investors to go on set because I needed more and more money. So I basically just had the investor there talking to the investor while the actors are all talking. And of course, while the scene was still going on, I basically set up the scene. We filmed it a couple of times now. I was like, hey, let's do a few more takes and have my assistant director, uh, Carrie, to take over so that I can go into the other room and basically convince the investor to give us more money today because we need it to, to film the rest. So yeah, so all in all is that it, it, it was challenging because I actually had to wear both hats, you know, as a producer and as a director at the same time trying to raise money. And uh, um, yeah, looking back, you know, I think we did, uh, we did a, a great job with, uh, with the limited amount of budget that we had. But yes, yeah, just like our Twitter conversation, I really wish, I wish that we had three more hours at the basement and maybe like five thousand dollars more during production yeah. it would have you know it would have answered a lot of the questions that i guess you know uh, uh, follows fans have been asking like hey why is this the case oh uh, yeah the ending you know why did why did we see this when did we see that the ghost effects why you know why was it this way instead of that right so everything was planned and that's all we needed. Three hours and five months. <laughs> we, were, um, we were shooting in that basement until truly the last minute of production. We, <laughs> it was the last <laughs> thing we shot. And I remember it was like, we got 15 minutes left to shoot the entire, like the movie only has 15 minutes left. And we got to get this basement scene and we're going to do it. And we flew through and we, I mean, I thought that we had the perfect amount of time, but I would be very curious to see what Antoine would have wanted to do. With just a few more hours, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, 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 even, I can even tell you the content was 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 it, it would have been pretty crazy. I mean, you know, not to get into spoiler, you know, ter uh, territory. If you guys haven't seen the movie yet, don't listen to this part. Yeah, <laughs> but skip yeah, ahead. If you haven't seen the movie yet, watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, uh, um, it would have been like you know, Mike would basically run towards the door. The door would be completely locked. And then he'd try to get out, he couldn't get out. And then the camera would turn back and you see the mannequin started to move. And then the ghost started to move from the other, you know, from, from the other side of the basement. So that Mike had no choice but to run towards the back side of the side of the basement. There's also a fence there. He was supposed to climb on that fence. A ghost attacked him. He fell down. He started running. That's when he hit the mannequin, broke his hand. As he fell back, the ghost started to approach him. And as he turns around, there's another ghost behind him, grabbed him like this from behind. All of that was explained. I mean, all of that was there, was planned. I couldn't do it. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, I, it you... was so then, like, you know, then one of the, the camera, one of the ghosts supposedly would actually push the camera forward to Matt, you know, like have a close up of Matt, I'd have him crying and begging, you know, for forgiveness. Right. It's like it's I have that plan like, man, I really wanted I freaking wanted to do that shot so bad because that would have been the ending that I wanted to do, the climax that I wanted to do. Right. But unfortunately, money ran out. But anyway, with that being said, though, I think it's like, you know, what, what I have planned, I think it's the, it's very good. So therefore, I would totally use it again you know, for maybe for the sequel. Sequel. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a. Uh... That sounds that like a fantastic. Awesome. I will say, I'm glad that I didn't have to climb the fence, though. <laughs> okay, you would have climbed the fence, and something would, you know, would have started to, uh, you know, things like that. It would have been pretty awesome. Wow, I had a plan too. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like a fantastic ending, and I'm, yeah. you know, sad. You know, I, I talked to a lot of indie film develop, you know, indie filmmakers, and you know, budget is always a concern. So it's it's not a oh, surprise yeah. that uh, those numbers are, are kind of crazy. But you know, that's that, that's what filmmaking in LA is like. Um, did you did you do all the filming in the Cecil Hotel, at least the the internal shots, or did you go somewhere else for that? Uh, no, we shot two different hotels. 
Uh, none of them was a Cecil. The, we actually did go to the Cecil. We did ask for permission. They didn't allow us to do that. It was... Uh, they didn't want to film about their horrible history. <laughs> well, I mean, because, you know, if you recall, um, do you remember the show American Horror Stories, season yeah. five? Yeah. yeah, or season four. It was it was it was about the same hotel. It was about the Cecil Hotel, and they actually used the name. Well, no, I, I think I think they changed the name, but they they did use all of the characters. So they used Elisa Lam, they used uh, Richard Ramirez, mm -hmm. and everything else too. Right. So because of that show, the hotel got really infamous. Right. So uh, basically, there were a lot of people just visiting. You know, uh, uh, just take pictures or whatnot. So the hotel literally told us, "No, you're not allowed to." So therefore, we actually had to film at two different hotels. One is the Hayward, which where you see the external shot, you know, the 14th floor and whatnot. And then you also see the hallways, the running as well as the basement. And the second hotel is called uh, the Normandy, which is in Koreatown. That, uh, that hotel only had four floors, but we liked the room. So we actually, you know, we used the interior shot for the room using from that hotel and, mm. and, 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 and the hallway where they're all sitting. in. So it's two different hotels. So we actually uh, have to our, our production designer just cut out little wood ones and put that on each door that started with a four. So it looked like it was four. <laughs> yep, there you go. <laughs> the magic of making movies. Also, I will say one highlight of shooting at the Hotel Normandy is that they um, were like, if you're going to shoot here, we need to provide your lunches. And they had great food. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was awesome. Yeah, they have a great, the, the, the diner that we shot in was the restaurant um, it was the restaurant in the hotel. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Cassell's. Was that the yeah. name? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I, just a little promo for them because they have a really, really good fried chicken sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's a glowing endorsement. <laughs> uh, okay, one other question randomly about the hotels. I noticed that it was filmed on, and a lot of it was filmed on the 14th floor, and it wasn't one of those fake hotels where the 14th floor is actually the 13th floor. So, so why weren't you on the 13th floor? I know there was a reason in the film, but is that uh, was that a true reason, or was there some other maybe superstitious reason that you didn't film on the 13th floor? Um, I think the 13th floor, well, I'm not sure, to be honest. Like, I don't remember whether or not there was a 13th floor. I think there was. but it's, I looked it's, on the elevator to make sure there was a 13th floor, at least on the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> I got to, well, you know... The reason why we actually chose 14 is because, you know, part of the script is that you have to go through, you know, like over 10 floors and all that. And also another reason why we're going to do 14 is because the Normandy, you know, the, 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 the fourth floor is basically the floor that is most available for us to use. So we had to basically use, you know, the fourth floor. And the easiest way to, you know, make sure that all of the doors is 14 is all you have to do is just put a one on top, you know, a, 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 a in front of it, right? And that's why we actually use 14 instead of 13, because it's just easier for us from a production standpoint. And also, you know, from Todd, uh, uh, you know, from the screenwriting uh, standpoint, is that Todd wanted to make a march to the room 1428, which is, I think it was one of the, you know, one of the horror tropes or whatever, the room 14, what not, 1408 or 1428. Yeah, I think it's... it's 1408 is the is the famous film. I was I wasn't right. sure if that was part of it as well. <laughs> yeah, it was it was more like, you know, our writer paying homage to that. It's a good movie. Yeah, it is. So you you know, your writer and, and you and, and Matthew as well did a lot of creepy research about the hotel and it seems like a lot of those stories made it in. Was there anything that you found that uh you, know, you didn't want to put in or was it was a little bit too disturbing for uh for this film or, or did everything kind of come in? Um well, you know, we, we actually put everything that we wanted in there. Uh, but there there are shots that are, you know, that even up to this to this day, we do believe those shots are real, true haunting. Uh, if we were to put it in the film, you probably would be able to tell. So I can tell you one example, right? So there's this there's scene where they down the basement in the, in the very beginning where Drop the Mic was actually putting the drone inside the door. So as he was putting the drone inside the door on set, right, he was doing that and he was saying, you know, to the drone, he was like, hey, it's okay, little baby, as he, he was fitting the drone in. So on set, it was fine. Right now, when we were editing it and we play back that scene, I kid you not, 100% true story, and we still have the footage. As he put the drone in, he said, it's okay, little baby, Literally right there, a baby cried. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I have the footage, and I will release it. The baby, you could hear it as loud as day. A oh, baby God. cried. 
And the real question is, how the hell is that even possible? We had 20 people on set. We had the sound guy. I was the director on there. I had my headphones on so I could pick up all the sounds. Nobody heard any. And it's not like something of a faint sound that you have to, have to turn up the volume. No, I'm talking about loudest day. Matt goes, it's okay, little baby. And then you hear, Wah! I was like, what the fuck? Matt and I, we were cutting it and we both got goosebumps. We was like, what is this? How did we even get that? So we basically, we, 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 we held on to that shot and we probably will release it later on. And this is true hunting, right? So that is just one out of many events that actually did happen on set. But yeah, no, there wasn't anything else that was uh, disturbing. I mean, like we wanted to, I guess, you know, show a little bit more gore, but I didn't, you know, I didn't like too much of the gore thing. So I kind of toned down those effects a little. But, but that's about it. With it. You know, there wasn't the scariest any part. The scariest part is I improvised that baby line. So I think I summoned something and it's probably still yeah. following me today and I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, I, did. I, got, I got to release that footage. It's just crazy how that even happened. So that's a true story right there. There's yeah. no way, you know, that could have happened. So that sounds like a, uh, a very good viral video that you could put out, you know, like true production haunting. Like that's a, that's crazy. I'm, I'm excited to see it. If, you know, if and when it sees the light of day, although maybe I don't want to see it because I don't want to like, you know, you don't get cursed. follow me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, part of the reasons why we didn't put it in the movie is because, you know, if you don't know the backstory, you probably wouldn't think anything of it, right? Because there's not a scary shot. He just put in the drone inside the basement and there's a baby noise. So even if we were to release it, people would probably think, oh yeah, they probably did it in post. They just add the baby noise to it. But the reality is that we didn't do anything to that you know, to, to, to the raw sound that's there. So, you know, we, that's a good idea. We'll probably release it and say, hey, true hunting. And we could probably, you guys can actually bring an expert and find out, you know, whether or not where the audio would come from because we don't know. And that's the genesis for Followed 2 right there. Born here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, this has been fantastic. I'm going to move into the lightning round. Uh, these are just you know, short questions, some of them tangentially relate to the film or, or your characters. You, you can feel free not to answer them, although I try to make them very answerable questions. Um, so first, did, did either of you actually spend a night in the Cecil Hotel? I did not. I refused. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did half a night along with uh, a producer, Matt Brubaker, Todd Blake, the writer, as well, and uh, Greg Berlin. And we, we spent only half a night, though. Like, you know, for research. And then after that, we, when we get out, we actually saged ourselves before we, <laughs> you know, just in case. So did uh, anything strange happen uh, during that half a night? Uh, no, but I can tell you that a lot of the inspiration, you know, so in the movie, you know, they talk about weird noises, right? You hear weird noises here and there. All of that was because when we were at the hotel, that's what we heard. It was just this ominous feeling you know like that that heavy that heaviness in the air that you feel that that's what i mm -hmm. i felt a little bit stuffy that's heaviness and there's just something that's ominous in the air, you know i really couldn't really explain it but it just you know it's just weird it's just that i didn't feel it peeps right and uh, but but you know we didn't see anything crazy which we just didn't feel we we felt uneasy it could have been psychological who knows but <laughs> who could know uh, yeah. We set up a camera for that night to see what to see what happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we you know, I still have all the footage and all that stuff. I just haven't gone through it. <laughs> <laughs> Afraid I might spot something in the back. So, other than summoning a, a demon baby, any other paranormal <laughs> things happen uh, either before or during filming? I mean, yeah, we had a we have a scene in the movie where Fred the head fell off of the uh, banister that he was on. Uh, and it was definitely not planned and it was definitely not intentional. <laughs> and he had been up there for like three days. So there was no reason that he should have just suddenly fallen in that moment. So that was frightening. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that there was some, I mean, the most paranormal thing for me, which was not paranormal, it was just disgusting, was having to pick up a live cow tongue covered in maggots. That was all real. It was all real. It was not very fun. Well, actually it's very fun. It was just all gross. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the um, oh, and uh, the elevator sequence, right? Remember yes. the when the light flickered? Yes, that also. God, that that scared me. That would really send shivers down my spine. Fortunately, I didn't have to play out the actual elevator sequence because of movie magic. We were cutting in and out, so I didn't have to do the full sequence. Thank 
goodness. Yeah, but the light flickering, you know, the, the, the head just fell off for no reason. Those are all, those are just, we just caught them on camera, right? But those were not playing. So. That's, uh, that's awesome. And also, it's also great that, uh, man, it sounds like, you, you know, you said you're strongest when you're improvising. That's, uh, it's good that you have that strength because those, those scenes were fantastic and it probably wouldn't have looked nearly as natural if, if it was actual movie magic, if it, was, if it wasn't <laughs> something paranormal. So. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Or <Thank> paranormal-ish. <laughs> Um, so I guess I, I think I know Matt's answer. Have you tried the elevator challenge? <laughs> Me personally, no. Uh, uh, but I did, you know, for research, I did go to my apartment complex back in the day, and I actually did. You know, there was only like five floors, so we really couldn't do it anyway. But I did go there pretty much like nightly at about three a.m. just to have the feel of what it's like to be alone in the elevator, pressing up and down. Oof. And imagine someone could appear behind or in front of you and when the door opens, it could be someone there. But I actually did that for about a week just to try to see, you know, the emotional state that I was in, um, you know, in order to capture them. But that, that's what I did. But I really didn't do the actual elevator challenge. That is a, that, that is a brave dedication to your craft right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Matt, I assume you have not. Uh, no, of course not. Never in a million okay. years. I will never. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be summoned to some strange no, I really otherworldly don't. Asian that, dimension? I don't think that's something that I want to experience. But I appreciate the idea and that the and the opportunity is there. If I ever do desire, oh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> followed, followed to the real haunting. There we go. <laughs> there you go. The documentary. <laughs> uh, followed to the documentary of Pana. Have you tried any other uh, you know, kind of creepy urban legends, Bloody Mary, or uh, I'm sure there's other? Well, before we shot, Antoine was really wonderful. He organized a ghost tour in Los Angeles for the cast and crew. Oh, awesome. So we had like dousing rods. We went to the uh, gates of hell, which are apparently in Pasadena. Who knew? <laughs> uh, uh, Pasadena is an interesting place. <laughs> it really, <laughs> truly is. Uh, no, it was really cool. That was really fun. Just to get a little spooked and also just to bond with each other was really nice. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it, was I mean, that's... Awesome tour. it was an awesome tour. It was the Devil's Damp. That's that, that that's the name of it. We actually had oh, a right. uh, a ghost hunter or ghost. Yeah, you know, so I, I hire a ghost hunter to basically take the cast and crew out. It's like at midnight and whatnot. It was actually spooky. It was cool. Like we actually had all of the equipment. You know, yeah. we actually had we we play all the games and so on. And so forth. Yeah. We we even made um, a vlog out of that too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an impromptu vlog at the end of it which 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 was pretty cool that is that sounds fantastic it's a great way to kind of both set the stage and also get everyone to bond so that's really smart right, right. <laughs> yeah. um did, so you know i guess maybe it's just the whole production but did, you know what is the creepiest hotel stay you've had if it wasn't you know the one where the head fell down or the one where the lights flickered is there anything anything in the past that uh, has freaked you out You're talking about other hotels or this one? Up to you. Um, I stayed in one, uh, this was, I think, a few years back. It was one of the uh, something manor over in, 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 in Canada. It's, it it looks like the Overlook from The Shining. And I think it was one of the hotels that inspired The Shining. And that hotel, you know, it's a really luxurious, beautiful cast, right? And... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, and it was fine. There was nothing, you know, it's just like, we didn't even know the hotel was haunted. You know, it was, you know, we went at, as a group with my workplace and, uh, you know, it was beautiful, awesome. And then three days later, I found out that this hotel was actually, you know, uh, haunted. So I started reading stories about it. It's like, you know, there's, there's supposedly a, a, um, a bellboy that died. That's oh. like, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you might see him at the corner of your bed you know, just watching over you. And right? like, you know, when I read all those stories, and then there's also a, a, a bride that was also, you know, that fell off the stairs and died, and you could actually see her. So, and this is how psychological, you know, how, how psychology really works, works, because after I read those stories, 
I didn't want to be alone. You know, that I would tell anyone. Now tell me, remember, I said this, this is not like the Cecil where it's run down. No, I'm talking about these are five star hotels, right? But it's still, it's like I would, you know, we would walk around and it would actually start feeling like something's watching us, you know, me and my wife, right? But again, all of that, I would, you know, attribute that to just uh, uh, um, being psychologically scared <laughs> due to the stories that we read. But I didn't see any hunting. Matthew, any uh, any ghostly? Yeah, you know, I can't or... say that I have. I've stayed in plenty. I mean, the scariest thing is you know going to a hostel and worrying about bed bugs. That's pretty much the scariest experience I've had in a hotel. <laughs> that is a very scary physical <laughs> problem. <laughs> Indeed. Look, when uh, you're traveling alone around Europe and you're young and you don't have any money to spend, you you end up staying in some suspect places. <laughs> I have not done that, but I can only imagine. <laughs> um, so one thing I liked is that uh, Drop the Mic's character, his dog, I forget what the name of the serial killer, but it was named after some Dahmer. serial killer. Dahmer, Dahmer, yes. Yeah. There we go. Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, so do you that know? happens to be Antoine's actual dog. Oh. Antoine's <laughs> actual dog's name or just the dog? No, just the dog. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. He, oh, he does that. <laughs> yeah, he has tongue out because she has uh, she has no teeth. She's one of the rescue. Oh, is my baby. She's a sweetheart. She's fun sweet. to work with. <laughs> I got like three dogs. So I'm, I'm That's awesome. So do do you have any uh, Patsuchatskis that are named after serial killers, true crime, anything like that? No. Other than uh, Matt's tongue that he has left over from the filming. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the funny thing, though, that you might find out, like, you, 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 you could already see that Matthew, before I followed, Matt was not a big horror fan. Me, I I have to say that I was not a big horror fan either. I mean, I I love watching horror movies, right? Like anybody else, I like just watching it. It's just like, it's just a rush, right? But I, I would never consider myself as a horror, uh, you know, fanatic. Because I, you know, I only watched like the mainstream ones, like all of the found footage movies before I made Followed was uh, The Blair Witch Project, Paranormal Activity, you know, Chronicle, uh, you know, Clover, Cloverfield. But that's about it. I never really, you know, dug deeper into the whole, you know, uh, horror subculture and that's why i that's why I, from the get-go i didn't think i was going to direct this movie i was only going to produce it because i didn't have enough experience but now that i've done it i'm actually craving for more horror to do because I, I i guess i quote unquote leveled up you know leveled up since then i wanted to do more scare sequences that i wasn't able to do the last time so. that is that's fantastic and actually that, that brings up a point i was going to bring up earlier but just forgot uh you know it feels like this film coming out now it's almost like there's a deluge of uh like vlog based found footage horror movies i mean i think in the last couple of months i've seen spree this film there's one called death of vlog death of a vlogger and then no escape is coming out later this week so it, just, it seems like this is kind of maybe the right time when uh the found footage genre is kind of moving over to you know more of a social media inspired one is that did, did that kind of influence the release of this or is it just kind of a, a weird coincidence that all these films are coming out right around now all coincidences like mm -hmm. we we didn't plan on this at all like we didn't plan on you know releasing followed like during the pandemic we we planned on releasing it back way back in april you know as, as a, a traditional theatrical release but then mm -hmm. of course we had to shut down because of covid19 so we had to resort back to, to, to the drive-ins, uh, uh, to, to the drive-ins instead. But yeah, no, it was, it is strange where, you know, in the pandemic then you got Host, you got Spree, you know, Death of Vlogger, you name it. It's like all these movies are coming out all about blogging, which is, 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 is really cool, really, you know, serendipitous, but we didn't plan it at all. Yeah, it's cool to be a part of the sort of this like a r release of all these different, of this similar genre, but also it's really cool to be doing really well amongst all of uh, these competitive films. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, pretty much I can tell you that we probably have the lowest budget out of all of them just now. <laughs> I think Host, I mean, I, I, I don't doubt that, but Host, I think, also had a very low budget. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, it's... Ingenious. I, I watch Host, and it was brilliant. It's freaking brilliant how, you know, they did it all, you know, during this time. And uh, literally, the director wasn't even on set. Everything was actually done via Zoom. 
And it's all just practical effects. I mean, I had nothing but the highest amount of respect and, and admiration for them. Um, you know, obviously it was made like now. So, you know, if, if looking back, so if I have, if I have a chance to, to make followed the, during this time, it will probably, you know, it would still be a similar beat, but it'll be a scarier beast. It will be a little bit different. I mean, actually a lot more different from just a scared standpoint and more of a social, you know, uh, uh, conversations that I would actually put in it. But yeah, it's like, you know, of all the movies you mentioned, yeah, Host was, was, was fantastic. I don't know what the budget is. I don't know, you know, whether, but you, you, do you know our budget? Because our budget was tiny. <laughs> it's too straight. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, 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 so I'm not sure how much Host was, was made for, but I know ours is very tiny. <laughs> So, so shameless plug. I actually was able to interview uh, Rob Sav as a director of host. To go oh, you did right, awesome. right before it. Uh, awesome. It blew up, and uh, he was he was fantastic to talk to. There's there's some insights in the interview. If you go to the YouTube channel uh, the, on how he made it and some of the tricks he did, I think my favorite thing he said was he uh, some of the the death scares. He didn't tell the cast about them, so like mm-hmm. the reactions during the film are like <sighs> actual legit kind of scary reactions. <laughs> oh my god. Wow, that's I would you know. So is it on YouTube? I, I definitely would check it out. Did he mention anything about budget or anything like that? He didn't mention about budget. Uh, you know, he did mention that it was just like a, a project that was kind of grown out of boredom, and you know, it, it seemed it seems like it just you know he just kind of had the pieces that of people he'd worked with in the past. So I think I think it was a very low budget. He didn't mention that, but it, you know, it struck me as a as a movie that didn't have a ton of budget. All right. All right, all right. Yeah, I would love to, 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 to get to know him. Like he is amazing. I mean, that movie really knocked my socks off as far as, you know, just the craft of it. So I have nothing but admiration for him. Yeah. And for Ron, savage. <laughs> but this film also, I you know, I liked, uh, you know, I love this film too. It had a, you know, you, you kind of tell there was a budget issue, but God, Matt, I loved your character so much. It was <laughs> so fun Thank to you watch. Thank so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> I had a blast I had a blast being Mike. It was it was so fun. Maybe I'll get to do it again. You never know. Fingers you crossed. Never know. I've never made the ending to, uh, definitive. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, director's cut. Go back and and sneak in. Maybe maybe have some risk in there. I think. <laughs> yeah, or maybe you know he might come back with a sequel. Who knows? Or he might not. Who knows? There you go. <laughs> no, just, but, well, one thing I gotta say though is like you know uh, recently I've been reading a lot of reviews online. There you know there are those that really truly love drop the mic. And there are those that found him like really you know, annoying, right? And I think that's just a huge testament to, to 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 how Matt is as an actor, because as you could tell, this is the real Matt. He's nothing close to the character drop the mic. But a lot of you know, like you know, I got I actually got fan feedback. I got a fan emailing me and said, "Hey, this is great, but you know, is Matt really this much of an asshole in real life? Like he plays it so well." I'm like. No, are you kidding me? He's like this is this is why he's a brilliant, brilliant thespian. It's just is amazing. Antoine, but I don't know. I think there's one doing. or two people out there who would say that I am that kind of asshole. But we don't need to go. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can see a little bit of a mischievous, you know, streak in you. But I will say, once the script was in my hands and I knew the door was open, I had no problem walking through the door. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But you didn't talk to anyone because you don't want to get pulled into that dimension, right? No, exactly. <laughs> don't, talk, don't talk to the person in the elevator. <laughs> Basically, our movie is actually really just a promo of social distancing and um, not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> True. Don't get into an elevator with somebody, obviously. So we, uh, <laughs> so we have you to thank for this. Thank, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Happy to do it. All right, just just a couple more quick, quick questions. Um, you know. Matt and you as well, Antoine. But this is more for Matt. Now that you got this experience, you know, did you have you tried vlogging? Uh, you know. Oh, you know, my uh, it's funny. I'm actually in the Bay Area with my dad, who at the time was like, "Why don't you do it? You'd be such a great internet personality." And I was like, "I really have zero interest." Um, <laughs> also, I think that you know, we've we've sort of jabbed social uh, social media personalities a lot. It's a ton of really hard work, and it's a very specific skill set, and you have to be a good producer as well as a good personality. So that's kind of um, why I did not try that myself. Yeah, I think Matt would actually make a great vlogger. I totally would follow his channel. It's like his, the, the enthusiasm that he has, you know, the magnetism that, that you mentioned, it would have been <laughs> really fun. 
if that's there you go. There you go. Maybe you can you can try it out. Uh, we'll see some viral videos and then some uh, some new vlogging and uh, you know it'll you never flow know. into follow too. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, the last couple of questions. This is, this is kind of more for like drop the mic as a character, but you know, what's the craziest thing that either of you have done for social media? And the answer could be nothing because maybe social media is not part of your life. Well, drop the mic, risk the lives of all of his friends for some, for some likes. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I've taken, I've taken a photo or two for Instagram where I might be standing on a ledge that is potentially a little too dangerous. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty much the extent of it. That's scary. Yeah, for me, probably nothing. I mean, I uh, view, you know, view, if you look at my Twitter, it's like it's literally I just signed up for Twitter because, you know, our marketing manager told me that I have to. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, it's like, and, and with me, literally my social media posts, it's all about, hey, what's posting on follow? Let me just go ahead and retweet it because that's all I know what to do. I have no interest in social media. I just think it's, it's – it's just way too too time consuming, and you know, it just it's it's yeah. I, I like to have that, you know, just to put like family photos and things like that, you know, just connect with friends. But I'm not really a big social media guy, which is funny. I actually made a movie about social media. Yeah, I actually had to ask, you know, Sam, one of our actors, on, hey, how do you do this on Instagram? How do you even retweet? What is that, at, you know, that at sign for? <laughs> you know, I, have, I, I literally just learned that out, like, maybe about a couple of months ago. Like, it, yeah. Shout I, out I to a, Sam Valentine, who plays Danny, and has a wonderful yeah. podcast called One Broke Actress that people should go listen yeah. to. She's very good at this stuff. She should be, she should be dropping mic. <laughs> well, she's actually pretty awesome. You definitely want to send if you're her, like, talk to her about her, her podcast. It's actually really fun. I'm trying to think of a of a drop the mic kind of name for a, a female blogger, but I can't drop drop the Michaela now. I've been... <laughs> drop the mic, yeah. Well, yeah. There's something there. Yeah, I'm sure something will come up. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, you know, b- before we all go, you know, what uh, what all is next for you? Uh, you know, I know, I know this film was filmed a long time ago and is just now coming out, but I guess what's the uh, what's your, your next project or you know taking some time off? Uh... Yeah, you know, uh, I'm sure Antoine can attest to this, but the pandemic has really slowed the film world down. Um, things are just now starting to roll back in. So fortunately, uh, auditions are just starting again. And so I've been a little busy with that. Um, I had a radio play called uh, May 4th Voices come out through NPR this summer, uh, which is about the Kent State shooting in 1969. Uh, so I play multiple characters in that, doing voiceover. Tina Fey is also on it, which is super cool. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, I had plenty of coals in the fire before the pandemic. And, and now that films can finally start to produce again, uh, you will hopefully be seeing some projects coming from me that I can't quite talk about yet. <laughs> um, fingers, fingers now, uh, yeah, as for me, is that, you know, now that thanks to the uh, success of Followed, we as a production company is that we starting to put together a slate of about four or five films. Uh, I'll probably be directing like maybe half of them or two of them or something like that. Uh, and uh, well, one I can tell you right now is that follow two is definitely happening, right? I yes. don't. Makes sense. Yes, uh, um, there's there's a larger universe, um, you know, the whole follow universe that 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 um, that is out there that I definitely wanted to to do. And funny enough, have you seen the new uh, Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma? No, everybody's everybody's talking about it. Uh, yeah, it just got out yesterday. I think it. it was one of the Sundance winners that Netflix bought. But anyway, I I, I haven't finished with it yet. But like I saw, you know, forty five minutes of it yesterday. It was truly an amazing movie. It was truly amazing about the you know the whole vlog. I mean, the whole social media culture and how we are controlled by that. And funnily enough, is that the bigger universe of Followed that that Matt, our, our main producer, and myself have already created, is that it does have something to do with it. It does talk about it. It would, it would, let, it would get you there. But before we get there, we wanted to fill in the middle, right? And that's where we, you know, that's where we are right now is that, uh, that myself, the writer, and Matt, we are still trying to come up with a, I get the middle movie, uh, you know, to basically bridge the two. But it also has a lot to do with the movie, you know, uh, The Social Dilemma, which is how technology is really controlling us in, the, in a very insidious way. Right, and that is what followed the universe would actually be. 
and hopefully in the sequel I'll be able to actually explain more and expand more on what you're seeing in the first. I hope to surprise people about it, right? And you know, my, like I would actually hope to make it a lot different from from from, from what you're seeing. Now, uh, I'm not sure whether that would be my very next project because my very next project right now is actually a an action movie, an action drama. Uh, think of that as a mix between uh, Kill Bill meets Drive meets Lost in Translation. Okay. I know they don't match, right? <laughs> it's like three different genres and everything else, right? But, that, but that's, that's what I'm doing. I uh, can't tell you much about it other than, than the fact that it will, it will take place in Japan. It'll be, and it will involve the Yakuza and the cartel. <laughs> I'm already excited about that. That sounds fantastic. Wild. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's 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 that's prob most probably would be my next project. We're hoping to film next year, uh, maybe you know back to back with Follow Two as well. We don't know yet, but that is something that we're planning on. And yeah, uh, we're just waiting for I guess the pandemic to be at least you know over uh, almost over. And I think we're almost there. But hopefully by the by early next year, we should be able to go back into full production. Well, awesome. That sounds both. That sounds fantastic, and uh, it sounds like both of you are staying busy, even even though everything has slowed down. So that's great to hear. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. The film is followed. It's available digitally. Uh, it's a it's a really interesting found horror or found footage horror film. It uh, has some fantastic acting, and uh, some some really good effects on a shoestring budget. So uh, go ahead and check that out. And, and thank you, Matthew and Antoine, for joining me. Thank you, David. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Take care, awesome. everybody. Thanks. Take care, guys. Take care. That was Antoine and Matthew from the all-new found footage horror film, Followed. It's available on demand and digitally in pretty much every platform, so if you're interested in checking it out, you can easily and watch it from the comfort of your home. If you like this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel as it helps us out a lot and make sure all of our new videos go straight to you. And as always, please go to watcherpass.com for all your movie reviews, interviews, and recommendations. Thank you. <laughs>